how are you and how are things with you during I'm COVID? Well, thank you. Uh, considering as an uh, elder, I fell over the other day uh, catching a bus, going to meet uh, a student I'm mentoring, and it was important I turned up on time. I ended up injuring myself, but uh, I'm okay. I'm under the doctor. I've had yeah. my jabs, my COVID jabs. I'm saying to everybody in the black community, African, Caribbean, Asian, and people of color, they should have the jab. Hmm. Take the flu jab, so why not take the COVID jab? I mean, sometimes yeah. I feel that we're being used as guinea pigs in society, but um, anyway, I'm sure we're going to touch on a number of topics today. Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah. So, Mark, yeah, why don't you um, give our audience a little bit about um, your experiences um, campaigning? So, how did you get into activism? Well, I went to a school where I was the only uh, black student the secondary school. Uh, I'd um, been born in Marston Green, um, Solihull, uh, in Warwickshire. That was the um, maternity hospital for Birmingham. And so a number of us of my generation in the 50s were born there. My father had fought in the Second World War. He'd come over from Jamaica as a teenager in the RAF, the Royal Air Force. And my mother was uh, Ope. She was from Finland. And uh, so they were both migrants. And they met each other in Birmingham. And a um, guy came along. Um, my father was one of the first Caribbeans to own his own house in Hansworth in the 1950s. Um, I uh, was brought up in a children's home in Hagley, just outside Birmingham. And then I moved, I was fostered by um, uh, uh, an English couple, fostered uh, in uh, Borsal Heath, which is in Sparkbrook, um, part of what used to be Roy Hatters's constituency. He used to be the deputy leader of the Labour Party, he was very anti-black section. Okay. So from there I went to Surrey, lived on a traveller's site actually. So I got a good position on Roma and travellers as a result of having lived side by side with travellers. Uh, the coldest winter, 1962, when my sister was born. And we had a sandpipe and we had an outside Elton chemical toilet. Uh, it was tough, man. I used to think that people in council houses were rich. It's all comparative, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so I had quite a, a tough start to life. Um, and um, then I went to school in Surrey as the only black student, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, very aware that I was different that I was black, and um, used the book club to get radical black literature and educate myself. You know, it was like a parallel ed education going on, reading Franz Fanon and about the Panthers, Bobby Seale, Huey P. Newton, Eldridge Cleaver, James Baldwin. There wasn't so much black literature from Britain that I could get my hands on, because all of the people I've mentioned, Angela Davis, are Americans, aren't they? Mm. And so I was a late convert, really. I mean, there was some South African literature. There was Steve Biko, I Write What I Like, um, Walter Rodney, Eric Williams. But not a lot of black Britain. I mean, now you think of people like uh, Althea jones Leconte and the Mangrove Nine, we saw the Small Axe film from Steve McQueen. Um, Jaya Ben Desai, who led the Grunwick industrial struggle. Um, uh, we had uh, Asian people, black people in the suffragettes movement that won women the right to vote in this country. Uh, mm -hmm. People like Claudia Jones, the great socialist from Trinidad, who founded the West Indian Gazette, 
way back when. So really, I've been very lucky to have been around uh, during the 60s and 70s when the whole issue of black consciousness, black power, was at the very forefront, civil rights movement, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King. I lived through that period. Mm. It was the news, you know, when I watched television, on the radio, in the newspapers. And that very much um, gave me a, a very solid foundation mm. for my, my politics. Um, and then I became to understand about class. So that's race, yeah. about the importance of class in all of this. That the two go hand in hand. And um, that we have, a, have, have to have a, a, a perspective that embraces the organized labor in the trade unions and the Labour Party. I was more a trade union activist before I was active in the Labour Party. Mm. I was a father of the chapel, which is the equivalent of a shop steward in the National Union of Journalists. Mm. On my newspaper, I started in local newspapers on the Surrey mm. Daily Advertiser in Guildford. I was actually the first person on the scene of the Guildford bombing, the Horse and Groom pub, which was um, demolished uh, in Guildford. Um, when that happened, I was only 19 years old. It really was a baptism of fire. And then through my trade unionism, I got involved in party politics. Yeah. So it wasn't party politics and then trade union. It was the other way around for me. I've always been uh, very much a trade unionist. And I ended up as the chair of the Joint Shop Stewards Committee at Thames Television, where I worked as a reporter presenter, one of the first black British-born presenters in 1982. Uh, and that meant that I was uh, the leader of um, the four unions at uh, Thames Television, which we don't now know as ITV. Mm. And Thames Television was the largest of the 12 ITV companies, uh, responsible for two and a half thousand workers. Uh, big responsibility. Uh, sadly, we lost our franchise in uh, 19, 1991 because Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, took against us because we made a program about, it was called Death on the Rock. It was about um, uh, British uh, special forces taking out unarmed Irish operatives on the, on, uh, in Gibra Gibraltar, Death mm. on the Rock. And Thatcher was absolutely furious that a TV company should dare to question uh, her policies and her extrajudicial killings Mm. these uh, people so she said right that's it you're going to lose your right to broadcast during the week in, in London and I had to see uh, hundreds and hundreds of workers out the door and get them a decent redundancy uh, payoff mm. after that I uh, well I've been involved in the Labour Party black sections I helped to found it in 1983 mm. uh, that was the black caucus within the Labour Party which mm -hmm. was unofficial and we managed to make a little bit of history getting four of our members, Keith Vaz, Paul Boateng, Diane Abbott, uh, Bernie Grant, into Parliament in 1987. And then I helped draft the Black Agenda of 1988, a year later, which is when they formed the Parliamentary Black Caucus, which unfortunately only lasted 18 months, two years. I'm sorry it didn't continue. We need it again. Um, mm. And then we fought as black activists in the black section movement for eight years from 1983 to 90 um, is my mass holding up so far maybe 91 mm. and the black social society came out of that struggle which is basically the black sections by another name all of our demands for representation at all levels of the parties african caribbean and Asian party members, all of those demands were met. We elected our own NEC representative directly from our conference. We had uh, representation at general management committee level in the constituency labor parties, the CLPs, 
um, on the executive committee, on the local government committee, and that's now called the uh, local campaign uh, group, LCG, is it? I can't keep up with all these different changes in name. We've got to go back to what we had before. Yeah. Where the party elects, you know, helps to decide who the leader of the council is, who the chairs of committees are. We can't have this strong man, quote unquote, note it's a man, hmm. uh, uh, way of running local authorities where, you know, one invariably white male leader hands out all these goodies of cabinet posts uh, to a select few people who get loads and loads of money doing those cabinet jobs. But anyway, uh, fast forward from 1983 and 1987 and 1988 with the Black Agenda to 1991 when I founded the Anti-Racist Alliance, which became Europe's largest black-led movement. Uh, with cross-ups, party support, we had about 90 MPs from all the main political parties involved, trade unions, faith groups, black organizations. And the ARA, as we call it, or called it, had some great uh, successes. We changed the law twice. We got racial violence, racial harassment, uh, put into law as specific criminal offenses. They weren't before. They were civil offenses. Can you believe that? The police had no role. If you were racially abused in your home, you were attacked in the street by racists, you had to take a civil action out in the county court against the perpetrator. Absolute abomination. So we got the law changed twice. With the help of um, Jewish jurists like uh, uh, Jeffrey Beinman, yeah. um, we worked hand in hand with uh, Jewish comrades who were very uh, helpful and supportive. And uh, most notably, I think, helping Doreen and Neville Lawrence set up the Stephen Lawrence, the Justice for Stephen Lawrence campaign. And mm -hmm. through my contacts with the African National Congress, the ANC, managing to fix up a meeting with Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, two, two Nobel Prize winners with the uh, parents of Stephen. And that catapulted the campaign into an international sphere as a result mm. of that magnificent meeting with Nelson Mandela, Mandiba, um, who's, who said, uh, I remember it momentously, on the pavement outside the Athenaeum Hotel in Piccadilly, mm -hmm. where we met him, to the world's media cameras, it seems that in Britain, a black life is as cheap as in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not a single British politician had made such a statement. Mm -hmm. No expression of um, uh, commiseration from the Queen, the Prime Minister, any politician, any government minister. It reminds me of the New Cross massacre mm. that had occurred 30 years ago to this year. 14 black young people, we believe, massacred by racist white supremacists in the National Front at a house party. Well, it started off as 13, so we used to say 13 dead, nothing said. A 14th youngster died sometime later to bring it up to 40. So there was the magnificent Black People's Day of Action, a march of 10, 15,000 Black people from all over the country on a weekday. So they had mm. to give up time at work to march through London from New Cross right up to Fleet Street where the racist newspapers have been attacking black people daily um, across Blackfriars Bridge. And then of course, sometime later in April, April the 10th, the Brixton Uprising or uprisings, because it was on more than one day. A lot of people think it was just on the 10th of April. It was actually more than that. And I lived in Brixton at the time, and I was caught up in the middle of that. And that was black youth fighting back against 
police oppression, Operation Swamp, being stopped and searched and humiliated in the street just for being black, mm -hmm. and mainly young black males, who then decided enough is enough. Mm -hmm. And they fought back. And I have to say there was white allyship. This wasn't a black riot, quote unquote. It was an insurrection led by black youth, but supported by squatters who had a movement in Brixton. Claudia Jones was a part of that movement. Olive Morris was a part of that movement. Another great black sister. Mm -hmm. So um, that's me really. And now we've got Grassroots Black Left, which is a successor to, I said a successor, not the successor, a successor to the Labour Party black sections. And we're yeah. about to launch a new movement, the liberation movement, uh, sometime uh, in the summer. I think that's enough for me, Sister Andrea. Yeah, so Mark, um, yeah, you've touched upon um, grassroots, um, you know, the grassroots um, campaign that you've got going on. Could you tell us more about what's involved and how members can um, join join that as well? Yes, well, we have a website, so it's grblackleft.com, or you could just Google Grassroots Black Left. It's a pressure group on the Labour Party. It doesn't claim to be doing community campaigning. We're not trying to do what other people do better than us. Of course, we go along the windrush demonstrations. We support uh, the campaign for justice, justice for Grenfell. Uh, of course, we're involved in... Um, fighting the injustices that migrants face in the channel. And we have uh, people who, uh, you know, we all give solidarity. We've just brought out a, a booklet, a couple of booklets, actually. This is one of them. We have Ooh. a fantastic uh, grassroots black left health workers group. Nice. This is um, black people, racism, and the COVID-19 pandemic with a section on vac vaccines. So I've got a signed copy of that for you and your program. Oh, thanks. That's available from our website as well, along with another one that is Black Workers in Health and Social Care, a Blueprint for Action. So we've got two pamphlets out at the moment. We're doing some good policy work. We've got a paper coming out on Black people and mental health. Wicked. Inequality in, in mental health. Hmm. We're just putting the finishing touches to that. We've got a position paper on migrants. Um, obviously, we have a point of view about Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and deaths in custody. That's a live issue, very important issue that's being ignored. We want a people's inquiry into black deaths in custody. We'd actually like a black people's inquiry into the disproportionate amount of black people dying as frontline workers from mm. COVID. Um, so we do lobbying. Um, we uh, are trying to sort of grapple with um, quote unquote the replacement of BAME labour. Mm. <laughs> I think everybody's trying to find out how how you can replace um, BAME labour. So what have you been doing? What have you been doing in terms of that, please? Well, we've been in touch with Carol Sewell. Oh God, yeah, go on. Uh, pity she's got that name, but we won't go into that. And Tony Sewell, I'm sure they're not connected. We can get on to that race disparities report, which we call the yeah. sewage report. Mm -hmm. It's so disgusting. Mm. Uh, so we've been engaging with Carol as the um, quote unquote, I keep saying that, don't I, about BAME, because it's such a disgusting term, BAME. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I can't stand it myself. In Toxteth, uh, Boss Side, Hansworth, Bristol, St. Paul's, nobody calls themselves Bay. Yeah. It's the fevered, uh, grotesque definition of probably a white middle class civil servant in Whitehall hmm. who decided to recategorize us and we should reject it. Yeah. I am not Bain. I'm African. <laughs> I also have Asian heritage. Hmm. Anyway, I won't go on a rant about that. But anyway, BAME Labour, which was moribund, it didn't work. It was the creation of Keith Vaz, 
who went rogue. <laughs> um, Sukwa Amuna. Yeah. Who cooked up this fame labor in a House of Commons committee room, aided and abetted by people who wish us, they don't wish us well, you know, in Clearly. the party bureaucracy. You know, they cooked it up. It's a top down thing. It's, hmm. it's never going to work. And it was merely to keep Keith Vaz on the NEC for 17 years. Okay. And the and Gloria Mini permanent rep on the policy forum. I know the names. I can name the names. Yeah. Oh, my view about this, because I say it to their face. It was right. You know, they wanted to destroy the Black Socialist Society because it was called Black and it was called Socialist. Hmm. You've revived it with Black uh, Labour black socialists mm. you're definitely on the wrong side of that lot that <laughs> because they got rid of us and then i'm sad to say they used the trade union bureaucrats to get rid of us mm. and they're doing the same with the new setup saying that the trade union should have 50 percent yeah votes, which i think is wrong before 30 mm percent -hmm. i honestly and devotedly agree with trade union involvement. They are the backbone of the Labour Party and the Labour movement. But that is not to say that white bureaucrats in the trade union should decide who the black representative should be. That is wrong. Put it out to your black members. Make sure that your black self-organization uh, structures exist so that your members can decide who the representatives are. And, and that's being distorted, and it's it's wrong, and it, it can't work. I don't know how you feel about that. Well, I feel that um, we we need another organisation that's um, going to represent our voices. The current organisation that we have now doesn't um, is non-existent as well. It's currently just a Twitter page. Um, I've heard of members signing up to it. Um, paying the five pounds and not even receiving a confirmation email that they've even um, joined up with this organization me personally I didn't even bother joining it um, after hearing what hearing everybody else's um, comments about it however obviously we're there now the organization that's going to be putting forward um, neck representatives like We've, we've, we're basically pushed into a, a corner as to having to join it so that we can nominate people that we actually want as opposed to people that they're going to choose and put up for us. I'm going to make a suggestion. I think that the whole way it's conceived is ask about face. It's put in the cart before the horse. I think <clears throat> as black people should organise something. Hmm. And then go to the Labour Party, as we did with the Black Sisters, and say, this is our black organisation. And this is what we want to do and how we want to do it. Mm. Waiting for head office to tell you what structures are the right structures, which they don't want anyway, is the wrong way round. No, no, I agree with you. I guess it, it depends on, um, you know, what other members are doing as well and whether they take that organisation serious enough to put their money there. For me personally, I won't be um, joining joining them. So I can only talk about myself, but, you know, I guess others will do as they please and either join it or not. But I agree with you. I do think that another organisation should um, come out of this and um, it should represent um, socialists. Yes. So that's and what I think on it. Starmer doesn't want it. Even Jeremy <laughs> Corbyn didn't do anything in five years. And he's supposed to be our great white messiah who supported black sections, which he did. Mm. He didn't move on organizing or helping us organize the black structures. Maybe he was too preoccupied with things that he felt were, or his advisors thought were more important, but we weren't helped at all mm. by uh, progressive left leader in um, they knew that fame label was rotten yeah and wasn't functioning 
But what was done? I mean, they had the policy review, right? Mm. The democracy review. And all of us put in submissions on how we could replace BAME labor with something better. Mm. Nothing was implemented. It even went to conference, as I understand it. And they came with recommendations to the NEC. And we're still waiting. How many years later? For Carol Sewell to free up? You know, I'm, I'm not impressed. And so yeah. I think we'll go back to basics and, and just do it ourselves. Yeah, no, I do agree with you. I do think that um, we should go back to basics and um, do it ourselves. Let's see what we can do. Let's see if members would be up for it. That's all we can do, really, and um, work from there. But as it stands, obviously, BAME Labour is where they're going to be sending the two um, black representatives from. So, um, BAME Labour we... exist. They, they ex agreed to close down BAME Labour. So now what we've got is a situation where uh, effectively they've gone back to agreeing with us from 1983 that there should be a black section. Yeah. But they don't know how to do it. Because to understand the structure of BAME Labour, as I know you do, mm. it was an affiliate. Mm. So it was a separate organisation with its own subscription fees, yes? And yeah. affiliated to the Labour Party. But now they've closed down that affiliate, we are now a section of the Labour Party, like the women's mm. section or the youth section. But the problem with that is it might sound very attractive, but the problem with that is they can then close you down at a moment's notice. They yeah. can say, I don't want to have a black section or don't want to have a women's section or a youth section. So you're at their whim. I would much prefer us to go back to an affiliate where mm. we have control over our own organization and they can't shut us down yes they could disaffiliate us mm. but we still exist and i think that we made a mistake thinking that because fame labor was so rotten and, and and moribund and corrupt that somehow by getting rid of an affiliate because the last one wasn't any good we're in a better position having a section and i don't think that's, mm -hmm. true. that's true i think we really no, have no. Keep thinking about this, don't you? Yeah, no, I, I, no, I agree with you. I think we do have to keep thinking about it, and I, I think that um, people do need to come together on this and actually um, do something productive, such as obviously creating our own, our own affiliated organisation. But um, I guess it comes down to commitment, and you know, people having time to do this. There's so many factors that comes into it. To be honest and whether we'll be able to get this off the ground. But I do believe that there are activists out there that are passionate enough to actually want to create something. So um, I'm definitely up for creating something that's going to work for everybody and not just um, careerists that are not going to represent our voices. The start might be a Black Unity Conference. There yeah, has that's that. a start. Um, the grassroots Black Left are committed to a Black Unity Conference. Of mm. socialist black people. I mean, we don't want Kemi Badenoch there. Oh, God. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, she doesn't think that racism even exists, does she? So we ain't going to get very far with that. But I guess, Mark, obviously um, you did touch upon this, but what are your thoughts on the sewage report? Well, it's uh, predictable. <laughs> you know, during colonial times, they would get a commission together. There was the Simon Commission in India of uh, sellouts and people who agreed with them and they'd offer you minimal reforms, but they wouldn't offer you freedom. Hmm. It wasn't about liberation, it was about containment. And that's what you got with Tony Shul. I never agreed with a single article he ever wrote in The Voice, which I ended up editing. Fortunately, he'd left by then. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have fired him. Um, he's a reactionary mm. in the mold of Booker T. Washington in America, who said that the way to um, the way to salvation for Black Americans was Black capitalism. Well, I don't agree with that. You don't agree with that as a Black socialist. So these characters have been around for centuries, mm. and we just have to consign them to the dustbin and their sewage reports saying that institutional 
institutional racism doesn't exist. This is like Trevor Phillips, who talked about post-racism. Well, I don't think I've seen any post-racism in the schools where black children are still being treated as educationally subnormal, even though they don't use that term anymore. Mm. And there was a report, uh, there was a, a news report the other day about this, a documentary. Um, the deaths in custody, the fact that black people are nine times more likely to be stopped and searched and are stopped and searched in London. Uh, the disparities in um, the health service, in jobs and employment, um, mental health, it's all there in plain sight. And for Sewell, Dr. Tony Sewell, commander of the British Empire, to tell us that racism doesn't exist is an abomination. And we all know where that report belongs. And he threw us a scrap, didn't he, by saying, but I don't agree with the term bait. But what he had to say about slavery was equally abominable, trying to justify um, bits of it in history, which he's now recanted on, he's now relented and said he didn't mean it. I mean, it's, it's worse than laughable, but it could easily be dismissed. And I think it's a huge own goal by the Boris Johnson government, because I think even Boris Johnson was saying, <laughs> Well, I don't necessarily agree with all of this report. It was just so embarrassing. The a, a, a toilet piece of written on toilet paper. Sorry to be so extreme about it, but you know, no. I don't think we should spend a lot of time thinking about it, sister. I know it. it, it for me, when it first came out, and I just saw the reactions, like Paul Marshall, um, the Battersea MP. Like, she's written letters um, to them saying that she wants to be taken off the report because yeah. they've, they've yeah. included so many people that did not want to be included on this. That's so, right. like, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I saw a letter um, on Commons headed paper from Marsha asking them to remove her name off it. Yeah. And then after that, she, did, she had to do a follow-up letter. I don't even know if she's actually been removed off the report, but she had to do a follow-up letter to ask them to remove her, like that's how bad it was. Like they were trying to include everybody and anybody into this report. And, um, you know, now people, now people are pretty much spending their times, you know, writing letters to get removed rather than, you know, checking out the recommenda recommendations of this report because it's that useless. You know, there's nothing that you can take away from it. So it's just a waste of time. And, um, you know, it's not going to get us anywhere. But then again, there's been how many reviews in the past that have just been completely ignored? None of the recommendations have been taken on board anyway. So it, it just feels like it's just another, you know, tick box exercise that they've um, come together with, really, to be honest. That's just my thoughts on it anyway. Absolutely. If you can't even be honest about who <laughs> contributed to the report and they're now disowning the report, running me <laughs> past... Um, the Breda, um, uh, Tunde, a um, uh, whole heap of, of people um, have said, well, you can you asked us to contribute, but we actually didn't. Or what we did contribute, you took no notice of. So it's a big lie. Hmm. And, uh, it lacks any credibility. And you're quite right. There are other reports, the um, Windrush report, the David hmm. Lappin report on the justice system. Um, deaths in custody. None of those reports, the recommendations have been um, implemented in full. So we don't need another commission on racism, another study, another focus group, another audit. We need action. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Black Lives Matter, that tremendous mobilization of black youth in the summer uh, brought to the forefront talking about decolonizing the curriculum, decolonizing history, bringing down statues like that of the racist Edward Colson in Bristol, which I thought was magnificent, mm -hmm. thrown into the harbor. And look at the pictures. It's mainly white people showing allyship there. Mm -hmm. And it's a disgrace that Oriel College in Oxford 
has just had a report that they commissioned saying that Cecil Rhodes, that racist imperialist, a statue of him should come down at Oriel College. But they're now saying that they're not going to implement the recommendations of their own investigation. And I'll tell you for why, because billions of pounds are at stake in terms of racist white people who fund institutions mm. like Oxford and Cambridge. And they fear that if they bring that symbol of white supremacy down, roads must fall. Yes. Then mm. they will lose all that dosh. Mm. So when it comes down to it, it's a stark choice between stone cold white capitalism and supremacy and human rights and anti-racism and fighting anti-black racism. How stark can, can you be in the 21st century that racism, institutional, personal, systemic racism is alive and kicking in the UK today? No, exactly. It's, you know, it, it's true what you're saying there. And it's obviously, you, you know, we've also got this Kill the Bill stuff that's coming up as well. You know, them targeting Black Lives Matter, eggs are the Gypsy Roma traveling community, community as well, and even sex workers, like it's impacting so many people. So yeah, what are your thoughts on um, the Kill the Bill um, protests that are currently happening? I've been in on most of them. So that tells you the support that I give. And we met on one of yeah. the Bill, and you made a, a wonderful speech, sister. And I'm so proud that young people, particularly young sisters, black sisters are coming through and representing and we really need to give you support and solidarity that's why i'm on this show today because of you and uh, of course i'm opposed to that bill mm. a huge attack on our human rights on our freedom of speech on our freedom of movement and uh, it's been brought about as a result of the successes of the occupy movement the extinction rebellion movement the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, we've got a Home Secretary of Colour, Preeti Patel, who is the most reactionary against us, just like the Badenox of this world, the qua uh, crazy Quatengs of this world. You'll always have sellouts. And it's a disgrace that she is a hammer against our human rights. And being used, frankly, she's being used. Of course she is. Of course. And she's either doing that wittingly or unwittingly. But then I have to come back to the issue of class. Some of our people, and they may be our skin folk, but they're not our kin folk. Mm. They serve the interests of their class rather than their color. You have that with Rishi Sunak. You have that with Kemi Badenak. You have that with Preeti Patel, Kwesi Kwate. The list goes on. But the struggle is much more important than these inconsequential tokens. No, it's true. Let's not get too heated up about them because they are not even a footnote in history. Mm. As Gordon Brown once, uh, sorry, Robert Mugabe once said about Gordon Brown, they are a pimple on the backside of humanity. <laughs> and so we shouldn't spend too much time thinking about them. We should concentrate on um, building up our grassroots um, strength and power. And I'm really mm. heartened by the Kill the Bill um, mobilizations. And I will continue to support that campaign. In fact, I was assaulted by a police sergeant at the Sarah Everard vigil on Clapham Common. Do you remember when they were attacking police? Yeah, police officers were yeah attacking I heard about police. all of that, man. Yeah, I heard about that. And I was punched in the chest by a police sergeant. And I'm now taking um, action against the Metropolitan Police uh, through, uh, through uh, Weinman solicitors as a result of that. It's just unacceptable that that's really unacceptable. And um, I'm wishing you all the best with that. I hope you get the justice you deserve. Thank so, you. Mark, finally, my friend, 
what um what have you got planned for the future and um yeah just give us some updates before we move on to labor black socialists okay then well i'm very pleased that uh, grassroots black left which has been around for almost four years now and had um, some successes with uh, submissions to the democracy review on getting a black structure in uh, the labor party on our health workers group uh, stuff that we've been doing those pamphlets and and other good policy work that we're now looking to help found a black-led liberation movement along the lines of the anti-racist alliance with mm -hmm. your support we've got uh, support now from black community organizations faith groups black politicians trade unions and it's looking good but we're taking our time we're not rushing to do this mm -hmm. because we want it to be as consensual and as grassroots, bottom-up as possible, flat structure of leadership. And it builds on the successes of Black Lives Matter. Now, some people have said to me, uh, in a sort of uh, fairly contrary way, Black Lives Matter wasn't a success. It might have mobilized tens of thousands of youth on the streets. Mm -hmm. Has its demands been realized? And the reality is no. But what I say is, look at the positives. Hmm. It was black run, black led, use on the streets day after day. And we're both old enough to remember it used to take months to get a national mobilization on the streets. They were doing it day after day using hmm. Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Fantastic. And so for me, that's a success. But that success has got to be built on. The momentum has got to be kept going. Mm -hmm. The way forward is to tap into white allyship. Yeah. Black-led, black-run, but we have white allies in it, from the trade union movement, from the labor movement, from the communities, from politicians. And that way we can build something lasting that fights anti-black racism, Afrophobia, Islamophobia, and all forms of hatred. Fights for reparations, mm. which is long overdue. We were owed, tri owed trillions as the descendants of Africans, ten tens of millions of whom worked for free for 400 years or more. And we're still suffering colonialism now. Look what's happening in Palestine and the oppression of the Palestinians, the bombardment, the constant bombardment from sea, land and air of people of colour. Don't forget the Palestinians are people of colour. Yeah. And they're living in the largest open-air jail in Gaza in the world. And they don't have their freedoms under settler, the settler colonialism of Netanyahu's Israel. Hmm. My heart bleeds for that oppression. And it's part of our international struggle, isn't it? Yeah, against exactly. Inhumanity against oppression, against imperialism. And um, there's lots to do. Yeah. I'll give it my last shot. You know, I'm getting on a bit now. Oh, no, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the sh um, show today, Mark, and um, we'll definitely be having you back on. And, yeah, please keep in touch with us and um, keep watching our show. And it's Thank just you. been Thank an you. absolute pleasure having you here. I'm really, really delighted Thank that I got to speak to you today. Don't forget my book, Comrade I Sam. won't forget your book, I promise. About a great politician of colour, Shapuji Saklatvala, who first <laughs> served the constituency of Battersea North in 1922, a long time ago. Let's not forget our sheroes and heroes. Of course not, my brother. We will definitely not forget them. And thank you again for coming on. My pleasure. So right now we are going to hand over to the wonderful Ridwan, who is going to tell us what Labour Black Socialists have been up to this week. You're mute. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me on the show. 
it is a blessing. I could actually ask you to just, with great difficulty I would accept it, but keep me quiet and just play that tape again. <laughs> because it tells us where we come from. That we were not oppressed last night and we are not going to have our dignity back tonight. When you listen to our brother Mark, and then he takes us to 1929 at the end, with a book that he had just uh, published, it tells you that it's, we have some unfinished debts to pay. That's why we are organizing as black people. We owe those who paid the price and we have a responsibility to those who come after us. Your daughter at all these awkward demonstrations needs to know that her mother and her mother's friends, allies, brothers and sisters took responsibility as our brother Mark has and his generation. But we only have a few minutes left. And the campaigns are very busy. I'll just mention them in passing. People must please do their best, remain as honorable as they have been in the United General Secretary election campaign because the Unite election is teaching the Labour Party something about managing differences. And the, the, the differences are significant, but no one is demonizing anyone. Or no one is getting away with it as far as black, Labour Black Socialist platforms are concerned. Mm -hmm. the, there are only two weeks left to meet the deadline for the um, meetings to be declared. Please check your membership. Please check with the secretary, general secretary of the branch and the chairperson so that your preferred candidate how about that? Your preferred candidate, people know who our preferred candidate is, but your preferred candidate could perhaps meet the 170 branch, 74 branch nomination. Let's keep it there. But do not weaponize our brother when he makes mistakes because then we defend him. And it's very difficult to oppose Labour Black Socialists on these issues, even though with amongst ourselves, we have differences about these. It's important also that people take care. The deadline for the annual women's conference in the Labour Party, the deadline for motions to that conference is very soon. It is within days. Please attend to that because as much as we are on the streets and as much as we are on social media, there is a bureaucratic struggle to advance the issues that are of concern to us. So please attend to that and please ensure that the delegates to that conference are people who will advance the objectives that we have. There are also deadlines for CLPs to, to choose delegates and formulate motions for the Labour Party annual conference, because again, on the streets we must be. But the one thing that the right wing in the Labour Party have refined to a fine art is how to win control of the bureaucracy. There are deadlines for the Labour Party conference uh, motions, um, the CLPs need to determine the delegates. Please get involved in these things because what, it is at conference that the struggle for Evans's confirmation is to be determined. It is at conference that many of the policy issues that concern us are to be debated. 
please attend to that. There was the TUC uh, conference over the weekend of the one year on our brother George, George Floyd, the anti-racism conference, and uh, uh, um, on, on the back of that, we found the issues in the George Floyd uh, campaign just exploded with the Palestinian issue. Attend to that. It, there is nothing to be anti-anything. Just be pro-justice for all. The, the, the silence of the Labour Party on this issue is quite deafening. We have the petition still to uh, grant amnesty to undocumented migrants. We see that the government is still committed to deporting the people whose deportation in Glasgow was stopped uh, just recently. That campaign continues. The support not deport campaign for rough sleepers continues. We need people to continue to support that. There is the campaign to replace the definition of anti-Semitism uh, with the of the IHRA, which even which anyone who knows anything about it knows that that's a clumsy definition. Even the EHRs, what's it? EHRC, the committee responsible for defending human rights in this country, said, "No, this is a clumsy definition. You can't do anything with it." The Labour Party hangs on to it as if it's the gospel. But be that as it may, it's not the first catastrophic mistake that they make. Um, the issue is that there is a campaign to replace that declaration with the Jerusalem Declaration. And the aim is to perhaps have conference attend to that. So I think that I could go into details with just about everything that I had mentioned, but we don't actually have time. We've run out on time. It is not that if we had another hour, I could speak about all these things. <laughs> so we need to we need to give the keep the editors out of work. And that is for me to keep quiet. Yeah. Ooh, that, that is very difficult. Aww. But thank you, Ritawan. Anyone, anyone who wants to know what the moral compass for black people is to be, listen to our brother Mark and the interview that you had with him, mm. and you will have a clear path forward. It's been a blessing even though I had very little to say because I didn't need to say anything today. Everything was said even before I came on. Thank you, Ridwan, for the update. And yeah, thank you everybody for joining us this week. It has been an absolute pleasure having Mark on today and learning about all of his experiences. So I hope you all enjoy the show and we'll